Hello. Oh, hello. Sorry for the delay. It's the screen. So as you can see on the slide, this is a life coding server as a function with HTTPK. And life coding means I won't have like too many slides and will be mostly writing code. Server as a function is a concept I think coming from this paper, which is about Finnegal. And I'll explain it like by example a bit later. And HTTPK is the library which I'm talking about. It's like a library written in Kotlin for server side mostly. And uh, it is an open source, that's the website of HTTPK. And it's an open source, you can see source code on GitHub. So that's, that's explaining the title. And as a motivating problem, I'll write a simple board for a tic-tac-toe game, which is also not known as nuts and crosses. And overall, the architecture of this will be that we will have a game front end, which will get, receive HTTP requests from the browser, will forward them as like get post to backend, backend will send back JSON, front end will render HTML, which will send back to the browser, so quite simple. And I will use for it IntelliJ and Kotlin, and actually that's the new logo, and I'm not a designer person, but I think the old one meshed better with IntelliJ logo. And with that, I'll just move on to coding. So here is IntelliJ ID in presentation mode, so there is some project set up, and here is Hello World. So if I run this, as you can see, it prints Hello World, so it means it works. And before we write the boards, let's write like a simpler version, like Hello World in HTTPK. So the most fundamental concept in HTTPK is an HTTP handler, which is a function which takes a request. It's an immutable request, and it returns an immutable response. So in the response, I'm specifying status OK, and then as a body, I'll just copy this hello thing. So I can run it now, and it should like not terminate because Oh, I cannot, I mean, I can run it now, but it won't do anything because it's just a lambda, of course. And I can go to source code of HTTP handler, and this is now a HTTPK library. So it's literally is just a type ls from request to response, it's very simple. So obviously when I ran it, it did nothing. And to do hello world server, we need to ask HTTPK to plug it into an actual server. So here I'll use Apache server on port 8080, and then I say start. So if I run this, this should not terminate. And Apache server here, it's uh, an HTTP4K wrapper which plugs this Lambda in, into an actual server. So HTTP4K is just a wrapper. Uh, it integrates with different servers and clients, and it doesn't like have its own server. So it's really a kind of integrational project. So here we have something running in the background. So if I do curl to localhost 8080, we see that curl did a request, so did this get HTTP, and we got back a response which says hello world. So the whole thing actually works. This is kind of cool, but it would be nice to do the same thing maybe from Kotlin. And we can do it using HTTPK, using, uh, we can define an HTTP client, which is like quite important thing is the same type as server, and so they're both HTTP handlers. And here I'll use OKHTP, once again, HTTP for K integrates uh, with the OK HTTP, so there are two classes with the same name. I chose one from HTTPK. And to do the call, we can just pass a get object into HTTP client, and we get back a response object, which we can just print. So if I run this, it should print pretty much what we saw on the command line with curl. Oh, yeah, of course, we should do get from localhost 8080, so that should work. Yeah, so it prints the same message to 100. The interesting thing, as I mentioned, is that both server and client HTTP handlers, they both have response object identical and request objects are identical types. What it means really is that if we imagine for a second, we don't really need to start a server. We could have HTTP client and then we just assign it to a handler and then we can run an application so it's kind of interchangeable. It's not exactly the same output, but for the purpose of the application, it can be the same. I'll undo this bit, and as you can notice now, I, our server is very simplistic, it just says hello, so even if I go to some slash foo root, it doesn't show 404, so maybe we should add some routing. And it can be done easily in HTTPK with a function called roots, 
which has a little bit of DSL, so I'll say hello, bind, get to, and then I paste the same code we had before. So this is an HTTP handler, and the whole thing is HTTP handler, so it's like a composite pattern. Uh, when we run this, like should be 404, so this actually worked. So now we have routing. It would be nice also maybe to pass some parameters, so I'll say hello name Bob. And here it would be nice to have the name here, so I can have a variable which we can extract from the request object. So on the request, request is an interface and it has few functions uh, defined, so we can have query which will extract name parameter, and so we have now 200 and responses, hello, Bob. There is a question, though, what's going to happen if we forget to specify name? And the answer is that this thing here is type is nullable, so we'll have hello null, which is not ideal. And one of the ways to deal with it would be to maybe check for null and say name is required. So then this is not nullable type. And, well, let's see what happens. It's like this line is going to throw an exception. Yeah, but like, if we look at what happened, we actually got 500 back, which is kind of interesting because we're definitely not returning 500 anywhere. So, so we just throw in an exception, and then internal HTTPK catches the exception for us and gives a proper response for HTTP um, server. That, that's quite interesting and would be nice to handle our own exceptions. And this is like a motivating case for the second most important concept in HTTPK, is, which is a filter. The filter is a function which takes a handler and returns a handler. This is the most basic filter you can write. It's like identity function. Uh, again, we can go to the source code of the filter, so we're back to HTTPK source code, and it's an interface which implements this type, which is a function. So literally, filter is still a function which takes a handler and returns a handler. It can be plugged in like this like, uh, to the, our server handler, we can say with filter, filter. Obviously, this is not doing anything useful. And to do something useful, we can have a wrapper handler, which is going to be HTTP handler, which takes a request and it calls the original, uh, original handler with that request. And then we can return here the wrapper handler. This is still not very useful, like literally calling the handler with a request. But now we can do something more interesting, like catch an exception and say it's going to be a response and say I am a teapot status. So if we run this, we kind of expect that we will see not, uh, we won't see the exception we've seen before. So and this works, so we get an army teapot. The crucial thing that is like inside, we have access to request before it even reaches the handler, and we have access to the response here after it comes out of handlers. So it's kind of wrapping handlers. This probably should have been called catch all, and there are other. There are other built-in filters. For example, there are debugging filters in HTTPK. So HTTPK is quite modular. I, th I think this is coming from the core module. And so we, we get this filter, which will print request and response, and then we can chain it with the filter we have. And overall, this is going to be actually two filters in one. The, so let's plug it in here. The interesting thing here is that this is a filter, and the whole thing is a filter as well. You would think like it should be maybe a list of filters, but actually it's just like a functional composition, so it's like the, the simplest thing you can get away with. So it's, it's still just a singular function. So if I run this now, we should see a similar output, but we see in the first place there was a request, which is printed by the, the first filter, then a response, and at the end this is what we print ourselves at the end. So this is also just to mention, there is a built-in catch-all filter inside HTTP server filters. But for any big project, I would really just like probably end up writing your own catch-all variation. So I'll, I'll delete the catch-all which we had. And that's kind of the advanced demo. So there are only two things you need to know, HTTP handler, which takes a request and returns a response, which are both immutable. And there is a filter which wraps uh, around handlers and they can compose. So I'll clean this code a bit before moving on to the tic-tac-toe. So I inlined the filters, so it's, it's a bit, all looks a bit like that. Then we can extract all of this into a function called new backend. 
which will basically create the whole server. So I guess this maybe illustrates the idea that the, your whole server is a function, which is HTTP handler. That's what it really means. In, Finag uh, in the original paper, it's a bit more complicated where the handler returns the future of response, but HTTPK is simpler, so, uh, and, and it's, it is a good thing. So I'll also inline HTTP handler, so this is one line, and for now we don't even need the client, so that's gonna be the starting point. So let's maybe move on to tests now. To, like, HTTPK was created by people who practice test-driven development, so it's one of the big benefits that everything is really testable. So to begin with, for the game, maybe we can say that we test a state of an empty game, and we want to create a new backend, which we can do just with a function, and I'll move it into a field. As you can see, like, you don't need any special, so like, to call it, we just do a get request like we did before. And as you can see, we don't need any special uh, like testing context or anything, any mocking. We can just like do like it's going to be a request to game, and we expect a K back, which we can create as an extension function on the response. So here we can say status uh, should equal OK, and this is status uh, OK and status. These are constants from HTTPK, and then we can return the response. So let's run this test and see what happens. It is failing because it expected 200, which is okay, and got 404. That's, that's reasonable because we're not handling slash game at all. Maybe we should. So that's kind of test, test driving it a bit. So then we're not using request, and maybe as a body, I don't know what it should be exactly now. We can like return dot, 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 and see if that fixes the test. So it does, and we can extract this into a response object. And from response object, we can get body as a string. And for example, just asserting it, saying that we expect some JSON back. So this fails again, so we expect some JSON got dot, dot, dot. And at this point, we probably should start writing something like a game, which is, will be like a board. And we could, like, as the first minimal step, we could create a game, convert it into string, and see how that fails. So that's the current plan. And game, I'll make it a data class, which will contain moves. Um, and by default, it's going to be an empty list, where move is also going to be a data class with um, x of type int and y. These are coordinates, and like in this three by three grid, and there will be a player who made the move, which is going to be an enum class. Um, and it will have x and o variable. So I'll, I'll run this, see if this compiles and like fails in some new way. So it seems like it works because it says game move. So that's representation of the game as a string, like a normal data class. Uh, to be obviously, this is not like, it's kind of like a board, but I'll keep the name game because we will play tic tac toe. It's not necessarily on the board. You can draw it on a wall, so it's maybe a bit more abstract. And at this point, because we want JSON, we could write an extension function to JSON, and HTTPK doesn't stop you from doing it. You can literally just like create your own serialization if you want. I mean, like create your own, just use Jackson or something manually. So on many projects, people do just that. But there is another way in HTTPK, and it's like a functional thing, which is called lenses. I'll explain it in a sec. So I'll use HTTPK, I'll, I'll use HTTPK integration with Moshi to use lenses. That's why I'm importing <coughs> Moshi from HTTPK. And then I can say auto body of type game and convert this to lens. And the whole type of this is bidirectional body lens. Bidirectional means like a lens is a getter and a setter. Bidirectional means it knows how to get and a set things on an object, and the type of it is game. And here we can use game lens uh, as a setter. So you see there is inject and extract. Right now we want inject. We inject in value into a target, which is a response of type OK. And that's pretty much it. So lens knows that I'm a body lens, so I'm injecting into the body of a response. And it uses Moshi to convert game into this JSON. So I can paste it back, and now the test should pass. I think this looks like moves uh, empty, looks like a reasonable JSON, so that's why I'm pasting it back. And now the test passed. 
Um, so that's, that's like the basic state of an empty game and using lands. I guess the next thing would be to like test drive more things. For example, you could say players uh, take turn on each move. And we kind of want to maybe make some moves. Let's imagine it's going to be post. I, I, I don't mean this is necessarily the right thing to design uh, anything, but just to start somewhere. We can say this is going to be how we make moves with post to the game. Maybe we'll make a couple more moves to have a variety of things. So it will be like these moves, and then we want to assert that the game, of, well, the state of the game has changed, and this should force us to so we expect like some moves, and this should force us to implement more functionality. So here it fails now with four or five method not allowed. This is because we bind in game to get and the binding to post like is a separate binding. And here I'll say we just return OK for now. Just to like move on to the next failure. And the next failure is that we expected some moves, but it's um, still the old JSON. So apparently, like obviously, we need to do something. And in this case, we need to extract x and y from the request. We could do it like we did just before using the query function and say like x, which is of type string question mark, null will string. And then we could do it to, uh, to int, for example. And this will be a nullable, uh, nullable int here. But like another option, again, is to use lenses. So I'll just do that because it's kind of a bit more fun for the demo. Uh, this time we want a lens which knows how to do queries, and it will be of type int, and it will be required, and will have name x, and the same for y. So this time we want x lens to uh, extract, so we want a getter functionality which is called extract, and here we just call function extract on the request, and we get back a thing of type int, so that's pretty much x, and the same should apply for y. So this, this here, we get an X and Y, and ultimately we want something like, we have a game, we um, call function, for example, game make move X and Y, and it will return a new instance of the game and we replace it. But we don't have it yet, so I'll just leave it commented out. And to move to that state, we need to maybe have something like a field. So I'll convert this whole function into a block body. So now it like returns roots, and I'll extract this game as a variable into here. If you think about it in some way, what we have is that this is new backend as a function which returns a function. And you can think an HTTP handler is an object with one function. Then new backend is kind of constructor for this object. And game is now a field of this object which we return in. So you can kind of do object or um, you can have like objects with just functions. Basically, so now we can update the game. So I'll make it into var, and I'll create a member function with all this. Also, like if we just at this point we like step back a little bit and see what we're doing, especially in tests, so we're kind of testing the game object and test driving it through HTTP, which is not necessarily ideal. And in the real world, probably would be a good time to say, okay, maybe I'll write some game tests and. I pretend we did this, and then I'll pretend that I typed lots of code, and I'll just paste it from a secret place. So the whole idea is that we make a move, and the move, if there is a winner, it will just return unmodified game. Otherwise, it will figure out who's the next player and add a new move to the list of moves. So that's, that's the whole thing, is just adds one move. And figuring out players, like, I'm not going to go into details, but it's like try all possible moves, winning, winning positions for, all, for both players. So that's, that's kind of it. So I'll, I'll run this and just see what happens. So we're getting a failure, but this time it looks a bit more reasonable. So we have this big JSON here, which I can paste back. It looks a bit scary. I could convert it to raw string literal. But I guess like if we're doing a property DD, we could like make it pass first. So this works. That's good. Uh, the problem with this is that it's, it's already, it's only three moves. It's hard to read. and and this, at this point, can be useful to use a game lens again. So we can use extract function, and we can extract um, game from the response. What we get back is literally a game object. So we can write that we expect a game with these moves, the moves that we made above. So it will be move with player x. Uh, I'll do an import here. 
and tumor morphs with fluoro. And this bit here too. So it, this is more readable than JSON. And we can use our domain objects to write assertions. And this is an example of why lenses can be useful. So you can write a bit more expressive tests. To be fair, it's also useful to have tests which kind of ascertain how your JSON looks. So you at least know that it's not like completely broken. So that's pretty much it for the backend test, like this super simple, minimal backend test. There are a few interesting things here. I think one thing which I would do is that I would make game a parameter, so it's like, will be initial game state. And it's now been added to the main function and to the test. So when we construct backend in the test, we could, for example, pass game, which is like almost the finished state, and then we make the final move and see who the winner is. That's one example. And the point here is that you don't necessarily need always a dependency injection. You can just construct things, and it just works. Also, the reason argument is like, okay, so but now everywhere we need to create games. But well, you could have defaults, and then I could remove this from here. Then. It's like the code outside of this definition is still the same. So that's just an example that you can go quite far without um, dependency injection frameworks and you can do it yourself. The other thing which I think may be worth mentioning is that HTTPK integrates with different servers, but it doesn't do anything very special. It's like minimal integration. So when we get a callback on line 25 or all of these lines, we don't really get, we're not guaranteed which thread it's running on. And so this is not necessarily the most thread safe code. Uh, I'm not saying this is a great like move, uh, but just to remind ourselves that this is like not necessarily thread safe, I would change this into atomic reference. And then we can do something like this. So here we just get game update and get, and it will be, will look something like that. So yeah, so I'll run the tests to make sure everything is passed. So this was a bit of refactoring at the end. And this is it for like the back end. So let's move to the front end, which is also going to be just a function, as you can imagine. And it's also going to be an HTTP handler. So it will be similar to the back end. So I'll copy a bit of the code into here. And let's say it's, we'll, um, we'll have routing at just slash, and it will return just for now body with some HTML uh, front end typo. And once again, let's like write some tests for the front end, which are going to be in the beginning kind of similar to the back end because I deliberately creating the symmetry between the tests because I think it can be a useful pattern. So here we have state and an empty game, but this time for the front end. So again, we can extract front end as a field. We can make it private. And then front end get should give us, at slash should give us uh, okay status. And this will be a response. But this time, instead of asserting manually, I'll use a slightly different thing. I'll use the extension for JUnit for approval testing. So there is a module which is part of HTTPK. Like HTTPK has different modules. Approval testing is not part of the core module. There is a testing module. What this gives us is that we can have an approver parameter in tests, and we can say that approver asserts that response is approved. So let's run this whole thing and see what happens. So we're doing a GET request, which should return us just some HTML. So this failed, and it should highlight in a second where, uh, here, says with the message, no approval content found. What that means is that this test, it created this file named after the class name and the test name called frontend test state on its game dot actual. And if we look at the content, this is the content that we return in. So if we like it, the output, and I think like it's okay for now, uh, I can rename it to dot approved, and then if I run the test, then it will pass. So that's the idea of the approval testing. It's also known, I think, and more like an Android as snapshot testing. I think approval is a bit better name. There are like, other reasons. Uh, th there are reasons. I think Emily Back. I, I can. I'll send a link to her talks, but I think she explains it well. So that's that's the basic thing for the front end. Obviously, we want to render something, and to render it, I'll use uh, handlebars. So I'll call it HTML renderer, 
an object. Once again, HTFK doesn't reinvent the wheel, it just integrates with existing rendering frameworks, for example, handlebars. It's not sure why it doesn't work, handlebar. Yeah, handlebar templates. And use something like hot reload, and it will be just because I'm lazy in the same folder, hot reload src, and then we want to use this renderer to render something which is going to be a game view. And uh, well, it just expects an object of view model, of type view model, which is a um, like tagging interface. So let's call it the view model. And we also need to create a file called game view HBS, which should have something like, well, like some basic HTML. So let's, let's write, write maybe this. So, hmm. French fries, maybe it should be France. Yeah, something like that. And if I run this, it should find this file, render HTML, well, render it will, yeah, it will basically return the same one. And then we should have a failure in the test because we changed the content that is returned by the endpoint. And it takes a while. And now the error says there is a mismatch. So there are two files now. One is actual, one is approved. If I diff them, you can see on the left is the actual. That's what we're returning now. So it did work, it didn't fail. On the right hand side is the old one. So I'll delete the approved. I'll rename actual to approved. And to be clear, there are plugins, so like you can write your own script to automate this. So you don't have to do it manually. Also, at this point, the front-end code, it's, it's all kind of just in tests. It's not really integrated anywhere, so maybe it's a good time to actually see if, like, plug it in into the rest of the program. So I'll do a similar thing as the backend, but maybe we can move backend to one, two, three, four. And then front-end will definitely need to talk to the backend, so we want to backend here. And conveniently, like, it's also an HTTP handler, so in tests, we could just create a new backend here as like as a function, it just it's a constructor, right? We could specify even a game if we want to. But here we don't really we, we could pass it by reference because this is an HTTP handler, but we do really want to have a separate um, HTTP client. So it will be maybe a backend client. And once again I'll use OK HTTP integration. So here we can pass backend client. The, there is a problem here is that we will have to know like the URL. Whenever we make a request from the front end, we kind of need to know full URL. And for this reason, there are some client side filters, which is one of the, f there are client side filters, and one of them is called set base URI from, where we can say this is a UR base URI uh, of, and it's going to be HTTP localhost. One, two, three, four. So for each request we're making through this client, it will like prepend this um, URI for each request. So in the front when in the front end we don't need to overthink it. So maybe let's run it and finally look in the browser if it works or doesn't. So I'm running the whole program and maybe I'll switch to you, Firefox. And it does work, so that, that's a good thing. Um, yeah, so the next step would be to actually render something because right now we're not even using the backend at all. And let's switch back to tests. Uh, I'll write a test, it will be like one of the last things to do. So I'll write a test which will be very similar to the backend. So it's all going to be front end, uh, front end. And here instead of post, I'll do get. So we are basically trying to make some moves in the game. So what we want is to have move, and I'll pass an X, X and Y as part of the path for like no particularly good reason, just to show a different feature. And then we want to get the state of the game, and we expect that response will be, again, approved by approver. So I'll put it as an approver here. And we expect it to be approved. Actually, I think I might, might be like going in a Strange direction, but let's 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 go with it. So here we expect something um, in the approval code. <coughs> C 
So it fails because we don't even have this uh, URL. It actually might be okay to just skip this for now. Maybe I'll, I should go back to this code and actually call backend first because it wasn't maybe the, it was a bit too early to go and try and make moves. So the first thing we could do is like just get a state of an empty game, the initial state of the game. So here is a backend, and to get the state of the game, we literally can just call slash game, which will give us which will give us back a response, and we can use a game lens once again to extract the game, which is going to be just a game object. Oops. So that's that's going to be convenient. Then this game can be converted to game view somehow, and. Yeah, once again, just to kind of cheat a bit, maybe I'll paste some code which pr presents, um, which represents the game view, which is qu quite similar to the board anyway. It's like a, to a list of lists of cell views, and cell view is kind of like a move, so it's X and Y and player, and there is some code which like loops over it. So it's, it's not essentially like a similar representation as a game. So then once we have this um, game passed into HTML renderer, we should also update this um, whole view. So we should have something like this, probably. So I'll show it side by side so it makes more sense. What, what we're doing, we have HTML renderer, which does rendering using handlebars. And on the right-hand side, we have handlebars, which receives game view as an object, so when we go through each rows here, we're going through each rows uh, on the object on the left, and then we're going through inside cell view, which check in if there is a player inside each cell view, and if there is a player, we just print the character of the player, and if there is no player, we print this URL with slash move, that's the next thing I was doing. And at the end, we check in if there is a winner in the view. So that, that's how like these two things match to each other, and that's like the whole point of help using handlebars. So we don't need to render it ourselves. So if I run this, this should now fail in a different way. So we should get another failure in the test that it's not approved anymore. So it does fail with this, and we can diff it once again. So. Yeah, this makes sense. So we have some kind of board, so at least the loops are working. All of this, like the burn no moves, so all things are just links. So I'll do it approved once again and just rename it to dot approved. And the next thing is to make the game do steps, like make some moves. And since we don't have any moves, so let's create this endpoint. It will be definitely the last feature and should be easy. So we have moves and then we have X and Y passed on the path, so which we can extract from the request. And in HVK, there is like another function which lets you do it a bit more easily, the called path, so you can get named parts of the path just like that. Then we, what we want, we want to call backend and post to game and pass X like this and Y like this. Obviously, we should check the result and so on, but just for simplicity, let's skip it. And as a response, we really want to render the whole thing again. So we could have rendered everything uh, again, just like extract a function and reuse it, or we could do a bit more HTML way of doing things and say this is going to be a header which will forward the location to the location. That, that's how front end is calling back end. So this is failing now in the second test, and it says expected 200, but it was uh, see other. This is because the like the function we're using for the front end, which is literally just an HTTP handler, it's a function, doesn't go over network. Even though we could like plug it and make it work over network, it doesn't do redirects, which we can fix using client filters. There will be a client filter called follow redirects, which we can wrap around this, and then it should work. So it did work. It moved on to the next failure. Now it's saying slash game, which I copied incorrectly. And moving on to the next, hopefully now it's going to be line 29. And it should say that there is nothing approved, because I never approved anything for this test. So let's see. So yeah, it says no approved content. And we can see there is this 
uh, for, which looks kind of reasonable, and I would approve it, but I guess it's also easier to try this. I'm, this is kind of the end of the demo, so I'll just try and see if it actually works. So if I switch to the browser now, we can see that there is a grid, so that's good. And if I click, it kind of refreshes. And players take turn, so that, that's good. And if I click here, player X wins, which is a good thing. And then if I click somewhere else, like the game doesn't do anything. And this is obviously like a very basic prototype, because even to start a new game, like re reset the board, I need to restart the whole server. Maybe I'll try and max up, make O win, if I can. Also reverse diagonal, which is like this way. So yeah, this wins. Maybe the last thing to try is to see if there is a draw, which is not like really handled in any way, in particular way right now. It can be tricky sometimes to make bad moves. So maybe that's not too good. Maybe over here. Oh yeah. Cool, so that, that's a drawer. But nothing happens really, you cannot click anywhere. So that's kind of it, and as a quick overview, what we had, we kind of had a bit of like main function, which really these two things, like backend and front end, they would be running different JVMs, but like that's what we had. Then in the front end, we had two endpoints to make a move and get the state of the game. There was game view, cell view. All of this could be like in a separate file or this low package, this is front end, could be done in any different technology, right, in like a node. And then there is lenses, which are kind of reused between different place, uh, backend tests. And we had some backend code, which was like just delegating the game. The whole state of the backend was in the game. And there is some domain classes like the game and move and so on, which should also be in a separate domain package. And in tests, there were three type of tests, which I think deliberately made some symmetry in a sense that you could, if you want, create an abstraction. So you check state of the game from domain point of view. You can check it on the back end, and you can check it on the front end using like the same DSL for your tests, for example. And yeah, so the benefit here with HTTPK, like what do you get from HTTPK, is that you can use your server as a function, which could be in memory, or you could use it over network, and it's super easy to switch. So this was a quick demo thing. So like, there are more HTTPK things which I didn't mention. So it has integration with more uh, clients and servers on the JVM. It integrates with other JSON XML libraries and template engines and things I didn't mention, which could be like separate talks like serverless platforms. It also, like what we've seen, has approval tests integration, which is a big topic on its own. Sounds quite simple, but it can be very subtle once you do it at large scale. Then. Like with approval tests, it might be easier to do like contract tests. So you test your fakes that represent like external systems more easily. You can do also with because HTTPK like it just makes chaos testing easy because it's like a single concept everywhere of a function, yeah. and it makes much easier to do record replay traffic and so on. So if you remember one thing from this, please make sure it's that client and server they have the same type. Um, and maybe it should be used more often when you design your own HTTP client server. So there is an HTTP handler which takes an immutable request, returns a mutable response, and there is like a filter which wraps around it. So that's the whole thing. You don't need to do anything else. There is no complicated life cycle. It's all like just normal Kotlin code, no annotations, no reflection. So what you can do next, you can like see everything I showed, all the slides are like on GitHub, right? And there is also a project by HTTP4K uh, no, there is under HTTPK account, there is HTTPK by example project. You can take a look at that. Obviously, source code of HTTPK, the core is not very big. It's deliberately small, minimal dependencies, so you can definitely read it. If we look at the history of HTTPK, there are two main contributors, uh, David Dent and Ivan Sanchez, and they did quite a few talks. For example, there is Talking Kotlin number 99. I, I recommend watching it, it was a good one. And uh, based on this, Dave Denton wrote a blog post where he kind of explained how if you refactor Java servlets, if you remember those things, then you end up with HTTPK. That's like a good uh, explanation. If you make servlets sane, you, that's HTTPK. And they, they did other talks like this one and talk at KotlinConf 2018. So obviously you can look at the website. There are some good 
blog posts there, like this one, MutHTTK. And finally, you can join, like you, I assume you're on Kotlin Slack. If you're not, you definitely should join it. And on Kotlin Slack, there is a HTTPK channel. So if you ask a question, you probably will get help like within a day. So it's very nice there. And this is it. Thank you for watching.